pleasure to be with you uh, this morning uh, to think together in the first hour on the relationship between regeneration and faith in some of the Reformed confessions of the 16th and early 17th century. Uh, the same topic will be looked at this afternoon as we think about that subject in relationship to Baptist confessions of the primarily of the 17th century. I'm going to have an introduction and then I want to look at for the sake of focus uh, really two confessions. Um, there are a multitude that one could choose from and I have chosen two. The Scottish Confession of 1560 that was drawn up by John Knox and five other men in four days after being commissioned by the Scottish Parliament. Interestingly enough, all six men, uh, their names began with John. And uh, it must have been intriguing if they were around the table trying to refer to each other. Uh, how they worked that out, I'm not sure, but anyway. And then the second confession is a confession that is probably not a well-known one. It is the one known as the Irish Articles of 1615, drawn up primarily by a remarkable man, James Usher, probably most well-known as the figure who uh, dated creation as 4004 BC, a date that would prevail for a lengthy period of time following his life, and we will say a little bit about James Usher. Both of them illustrate uh, certain commonalities in Reformed or Calvinist or uh, those the, the pe people coming from that perspective, their confessions, but they also illustrate how Reformed brethren sought to emphasize the same truths in very different situations. The first confession, the one of John Knox, is primarily directed against Roman Catholic theology, against the whole merit theology that the Roman Church had developed in the Middle Ages and that was ratified and reaffirmed at the Council of Trent from 1547 to 1563. James Usher's statement of faith looks at a very different problem and that is the problem that arose within reformed ranks in the last decade of the 16th century and would embroil them in massive controversy in the 17th century. That is the threat of Arminianism. And we'll see how the two confessions using the same truths speak to very, in some respects, different issues. But I begin with an introduction and then we look at those two confessions in turn. In 1582, a powerful Scottish Presbyterian preacher by the name of John Davidson, known by some in his day as the Thunderer, some idea of his preaching, received a letter in 1582 from a Huguenot, French Calvinist, who was in the French Calvinist bastion of La Rochelle on the West, in western France on the Atlantic. And not long after receiving this letter from this French Calvinist brother, he wrote to an English Puritan by the name of John Field. And he makes this remark to Field. It is no small comfort, brother, he told Field, to brethren of one nation to understand the state of the brethren in other nations. It is no small comfort, brother, to brethren of one nation to understand the state of the brethren in other nations a French Calvinist writing to a Scottish Presbyterian who the following day writes to an English Puritan. It's a seemingly casual remark, but it illustrates a very important fact that in the late 16th century, or actually throughout the 16th century, and throughout the 17th centuries, there was a deep sense of solidarity amongst reformed men and women in Europe. One writer has referred to it, taking a word from more recent uh, ideologies, has referred to it as a Calvinist international. You know the roots of that word international, it comes from Marxism, but it reflects this idea well that there was an international movement that saw itself as one. 
We use the word Calvinist to describe that movement. And by doing so, we sometimes mistakenly uh, have the idea, I think, that it all stems from one fountainhead, namely the recovery of these essential biblical truths by John Calvin, the great French reformer. But that is not the case. There was a host of tributaries in Europe who contributed to this recovery of reformed truth. And a better term to describe it is probably reformed. Calvin is one of these figures. But despite the common, despite the fact that there were different tributaries, German reformers like Holdreich Zwingli or Martin Bucer, men like Calvin, Scottish men like uh, uh, Knox or English Puritans, there are certain commonalities. Otherwise, there'll be no sense of this solidarity. There were certain things that these men and women shared. They shared a common doctrine. And we're going to look at some of that in the two confessions. The, 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 there's a commonality of doctrine in both of the confessions. They shared a common praxis or practice of the Christian life. They shared a common piety or a common spirituality. Uh, this is something that we need to recover, especially the whole area of uh, spirituality. Now, one of the most important, now to focus on our theme for today, one of the most important areas of doctrine that they shared was the conviction that was rooted in Scripture and attested to by experience that entry into the Christian life was a work of sovereign grace. That entry into the state of being re regenerate was wholly dependent upon the grace of God. This is a central conviction in the Reformation. In fact, this was more than simply those who were called Reformed shared this. Luther, if you read Luther's writings, it's quite clear that Luther is Reformed <laughs> or Calvinistic. That's speaking anachronistically on this issue. Let me illustrate this, and then we're going to look at the, the two main confessions I've mentioned. Consider, first of all, a confession drawn up in 1530, very early on in the Reformation, drawn up by Martin Bucer, the reformer in Strasbourg, and two other reformers, Wolfgang Capito and Caspar Hedio. The main figure is Martin Bucer, B-U-C-E-R. They had been invited by the Holy Roman Emperor to present the case for the reformed position at a diet or a parliament that was being held in Augsburg in 1530. As it turned out, the Holy Roman Emperor, who was Catholic, only allowed the Lutherans to present their perspective. But nonetheless, a statement of faith was drawn up. It's known as the Tetrapolitan Confession. Sounds like the variety of ice cream, but uh, Tetrapolitan refers to the four cities, Strasbourg and three other German reformed cities. In the issue that before us of regeneration, it maintains, quote, the beginning of all our righteousness and salvation must proceed from the mercy of the Lord. And then it outlines the process upon, by which God shows mercy to fallen men and women. First of all, it says God offers the doctrine of truth and his gospel through various preachers who are sent to preach the gospel. But due to the fact that the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, 1 Corinthians 2.14, the confession, the Tetrapolitan Confession, then goes on to say that God, quote, causes a beam of his light to rise at the same time in the darkness of our heart so that now we may believe his gospel preached being persuaded of the truth thereof by a spirit from above, and then relying upon the testimony of this spirit, may call upon him with filial confidence and say, Abba, Father, obtaining thereby sure salvation according to the saying, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Regeneration is what we're thinking about, and it can be looked at from different vantage points. This confessional statement looks at it from the vantage point of light shining into a dark place. The dark place of the darkened hearts of men 
and women. And God causes the light of his gospel to shine in and illuminates the darkness and causes those who are in spiritual darkness to see the truth of the gospel and to believe the gospel as they hear it preached. It's a very apt metaphor given the fact that many of the early reformers felt that the Reformation was a rediscovery of the light of the gospel. And while one would not to want to diminish the role of men like John Wycliffe and Jan Hus and uh, Jacques Lefebvre de Tap and others prior to the Reformation who knew Reformation truths, by and large, the period prior to the Reformation, the thousand years prior to the Reformation, was a period of great spiritual darkness. It is disturbing that some evangelicals today talk about the Reformation in terms that indicate it may have been a mistake, that it split Christendom and therefore broke up the unity of the church. And one wonders what these evangelicals are thinking about. The Reformation was not a mistake. It was God's great work of the rediscovery of the light of the gospel. And this looking at regeneration as the shining of light into a dark place is very apt in that regard. Or a second example. Again, we're still introducing the topic. This example comes not now from a German reformed context, but a French reformed context. And we're looking now at Francophone Geneva and uh, John Calvin, with probably with the aid of Guillaume Farel, the fiery, red-headed preacher who had first taken the gospel into Geneva in the early years of the 1530s and had preached openly in the public square and had been booted out of the city promptly after a few hours, had gone back again, this time was able to stay a day and a night, and the Roman Catholic authorities arranged for something to be slipped into his food, poisoned mushrooms. Pharrell apparently only suffered an upset stomach. And again, when they discovered he was still alive in the morning, he was expelled. On the third occasion, the city fathers declared for the Reformation. And it's Pharrell, I'm sure you know, who had that most interesting way of calling Calvin to ministry in Geneva, how Calvin was on his way after his conversion out of France. He had been actually expelled, along with others who had held to reform truth. Had meant to stop in Geneva one night. He was on his way to Strasbourg when Martin Bucer was. He had envisioned for himself a quiet, studious life of a scholar. Calvin was not a Martin Luther in one sense, the kind of robust extrovert. And he saw for himself a nice, quiet life writing scholarly books. He spends one night in an inn in Geneva. Pharrell hears of his presence and goes to him. Pharrell was an evangelist, not a pastor. The church needs the, needed a pastor. He asked Calvin uh, repeatedly over a course of a number of hours, will you not stay and help me? And Calvin said, no, it is not for me. I'm a scholar. I'm not a pastor, a preacher. Finally, Pharrell said the following words, paraphrasing. Calvin relates them in his preface to the commentary in the Psalms. May God curse you and all your studies, unless you stay here and help me. And Calvin said it was as if the hand of God came down and rooted him to the spot. He was terrified. <laughs> and uh, he would get to Strasbourg, but it would be two years later, and he would spend basically the rest of his life in Geneva. At the beginning of that ministry together, not long after that incident, Calvin and probably Pharrell drew up the 1536 Geneva Confession in which there are themes that are common to Calvin's writings. In it, they confess that re in regeneration, by God's spirit, quote, we are regenerated into a new spiritual nature. That is to say, the evil desires of our flesh are mortified by grace, so that they rule us no longer. On the contrary, our will is rendered conformable to God's will, to follow in his way and to seek what is pleasing to him. Therefore, we are by him delivered from the servitude of sin, under whose power we were of ourselves held captive. And by this deliverance, we are made capable and able 
to do good works and not otherwise. In that statement, there are themes Calvin would come back to again and again. What does regeneration do? It frees the sinner. It breaks the bond, bondage of, of sin, the evil desires of the flesh. Prior to regeneration, the human will is in total bondage and can make no move towards God, no move towards what is generally pleasing to God. But with regeneration, there is a total transformation of the will. This was rooted in Scripture, but it was also rooted in Calvin's own experience. Calvin, as I said, was not an extrovert. He rarely talks about himself in books that were intended for public consumption. We know an enormous amount about Calvin because of his letters. But they were not primarily intended for personal consumption. They were intended for usually the correspondent. In matters intended for the public to read about him, there are only three real statements in which he de details his conversion. The longest is in the preface to the commentary in the Psalms, in the, written in 1557. And in that, he talks about how God, by a secret guidance of his providence, changed his father's desires for him. His father desired him to be a lawyer. No, his father, sorry, initially desired him to be a priest in the Catholic Church. And then new winds were blowing through Europe, and he began to think that uh, the priesthood's not going to make a lot of money for his son, so he shifted him to law. And Calvin could say it was by secret guidance of his providence because it was as he began to study law, law at a different university that God introduced him to men who were evangelicals. And finally, he says that God delivered him or extricated, these are almost his exact words, extricated him from such an abyss of mire and he's talking about Roman Catholic piety. He knew from his own experience, he was, before his conversion, he was, was, as it were, caught in a bog. If you know what a bog is like, I remember as a young boy falling into a bog in England. And I don't remember to this day how I got out, but you don't get out of bogs unless there's somebody there to help you out. And Calvin thought of himself as a bog unless God had come and extricated him he would have gone down into that abyss. Or a third example. This one is somewhat later. These, again, are still introductory. This comes, this is a remarkable example. You may or may not know that in the early 17th century, the patriarch of Constantinople, Cyril Lucaris, was converted and became reformed. It's a remarkable incident. He had been an Orthodox priest in Poland, had met uh, reformed, Dutch Reformed believers and had begun to read their documents. And by the time that he was promoted to become the patriarch of the entire Greek Orthodox Church, he was reformed, fully reformed, and began to preach the gospel. And men, a number of priests, were converted and began to further the work of reformation in the Greek Orthodox Church. Eventually, he was murdered by Jesuit agents who did not want the Reformation popping up in the East. It's quite a remarkable story. And in a book, actually, published in 1961 by a man named Hadjian Giantoniu, called The Protestant Patriarch, John Knox Press. He wrote a remarkable confession, which is, I think, the only English translation is in that book. And in it, he says this. It was published for the first time in Geneva in 1629. We believe that free will is dead in the unregenerate because they can do no good thing and that whatsoever they do is sin. But in the regenerate, by the grace of the Holy Spirit, the will is excited and indeed worketh, but not without the assistance of grace. In order, therefore, that man should be born again and do good, it is necessary that grace should go before. Otherwise, man is wounded, having received as many wounds as that man received who going, who going from Jerusalem down to Jericho fell into the hands of thieves, so that of himself he cannot do anything. I'm not sure the example there is the best. It doesn't convey, I think, the extremity of the human condition prior to conversion. 
But you see the, the, the illustration he's giving. That the unregenerate before conversion are like that man who was going down from Jer uh, Jer Jerusalem to Jericho and was mugged and left for dead. And if the good Samaritan had not come along, he would have died there. Likewise, the unregenerate are deeply wounded spiritually, can do no good thing, and what they need is the grace given by the Spirit so as to be born again. Now I want to focus on, these are introductory, and they basically try to illustrate that there is a consensus when it comes to this issue of regeneration and faith in the Reformed community in Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries. That before there can be good works, before there can be faith, there must be regeneration. Regeneration is the prior act of God. Now let's look then at these two confessions in a little more detail. The first one is the one drawn up by John Knox, the Scottish Confession of Faith in 1560. The second one we're going to look at is the Irish Articles of, of 1615. It is interesting that although they, they, and then here we're looking at the context very quickly, it is interesting that although they are both coming out of a very strongly, solidly reformed context, they address different historical situations as I noted, they also would have a very different impact. The Scottish Confession of Faith of 1560 would shape and mold the character of the Scottish people. Very, and it would be the statement of faith of Scotland until 1647 when the Westminster Confession was adopted. It's interesting, um, people and the nations, and I don't, one doesn't want to be over, uh, uh, overly simplistic, but nations can be shaped, the character of nations can be shaped. And obviously not everybody in the nation is like that, but character can be developed. And it's interesting to look at two nations that were very strongly shaped by Calvinism, the Scotch and the Dutch, and how similar they are. I'm married to a woman who's Scottish, and her family on her mother's side are all free church, and they've married into the free church Highlanders. The church I'm part of, the uh, Trinity Baptist Church, half of the congregation is Dutch. It's very interesting when you go down through the, the list of names, uh, Half of them start with B and they go on. And um, I didn't know many Dutch people before I, I uh, started attending this church, but I started to soon see how similar the character was to the Scottish I knew. And what I would trace it back to is the way Calvinism has shaped those two peoples. The Scottish Confession of Faith would shape a nation. The Irish Articles would fail to do so. Ireland is the one supreme example in Europe where the rulers and the leadership of the nation politically were reformed, but the nation did not follow that pattern. And James Usher, who dropped the Irish Articles in 1615, may have hoped that that document would shape the Irish, but it was not to be. First of all, then, the Scottish Confession of Faith of 1560 it was drawn up in 1560 upon the recommendation of the Scottish Parliament. And the, the, the Reformation had just recently triumphed in Scotland. And the Old Alliance, spelled A-U-L-D, the Old Alliance of Scotland and France, which had gone back for centuries, was broken. It would re try to reassert itself in years to come with the the landings of the Jacobites like Bonnie Prince Charlie, but the, essentially the, the alliance was broken and the influence of Catholic France was ended over Scotland. John Knox was the central figure in that. It was Knox's boldness that encouraged the Protestant nobility to seize the moment and to declare the Reformed faith the faith of the Scottish people and to pass through Parliament a statement of faith. Knox, who the Queen at the time, Mary, Queen of, Queen of Scots, said she feared this man's prayers more than all the armies of Europe. And so it was the Scottish Parliament in August of 1560 
asked Knox and these five other men, whose names all begin with John, to draw up the Scottish Confession of Faith. They were four days doing it, and then it was ratified, and it would be the standard of the Scottish Reformed Church, or the Church of Scotland, until 1647. The 1647 adoption of the Westminster Standards did not abrogate the Scottish Confession of 1560. It simply reaffirmed the core the doctrines, but developed them in a number of areas. There are 25 articles in the Confession. They reveal, broadly speaking, the convictions of men who are convinced, and let me add, rightly convinced, that Reformed Christianity, the Reformed faith, what we sometimes call Calvinism, is biblical, evangelical Christianity. The statement that deals with the regeneration is a long one, and bear with me, I will elaborate it basically in three points. This is a, a recent translation. You can get this confession from a Presbyterian publication house in Texas, and that's the one I've used, actually. When it was originally published, it was in the Scots dialect, that ver variant of English. I read then, this is Article 12, Faith in the Holy Ghost. This our faith and the assurance of the same proceeds not from flesh and blood, that is to say, from no natural powers within us, but is the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, whom we confess God, equal with the Father and with his Son, who sanctifies us and brings us in, into all truth by his own operation, without whom we should remain forever enemies to God and ignorant of his Son, Christ Jesus, for of nature or by nature we are so dead, so blind, so perverse, that neither can we feel when we are pricked, see the light when it shines, nor assent to the will of God when it is revealed, unless the Spirit of the Lord Jesus quicken that which is dead, remove the darkness from our minds, and bow our stubborn hearts to the obedience of his blessed will. And so as we confess that God the Father created us when we were not, as his Son, our Lord Jesus, redeemed us when we were enemies to him, so also we to confess that the Holy Ghost does sanctify and regenerate us without all respect of any merit proceeding from us, be it before or after our regeneration. To speak this thing, yet in more plain words, as we willingly spoil ourselves of all honor and glory of our own creation and redemption, so do we also of our regeneration and sanctification. For of ourselves we are not sufficient to think one good thought, but he who has begun the good work in us is only he that continues us in the same to the praise and glory of his undeserved grace. There are three noteworthy statements about this. The first is the understanding that Christianity is true. That what the Christian faith proclaims about Christ and about God and his work in Christ that is not something that arises from mere human insight. The statement uh, has a number of scriptural texts that it refers to at this point. The, it has four. Matthew 16, 17 is the first. That is the statement of Peter. Of, uh, that is the statement of Jesus following Peter's confession. When Jesus asks his disciples, who do men say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And our Lord says to Peter, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. You didn't learn this from men, but it was revealed to you from my Father. The other three texts are all from the Gospel of John John 14, 26, John 15, 26, and John 16, 13. And they all deal with the teaching work of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus emphasizing in the farewell discourse of John. 14 through 16, that the Holy Spirit's work is a teaching ministry, a teaching ministry that is focused on Jesus. And this confession of faith realized that the great new covenant work of the Holy Spirit is to glorify Christ. I confess that a number of years ago when I read J.I. Packer's Keep in Step with the Spirit, and he argues that the core of the Spirit's work is John 16, 
verses 13 and 14, especially those words, he will glorify me, I confess that that has shaped my thinking ever since. But the, how do we understand the Spirit's work? It is to teach about Christ. It is to glorify Christ. It is to shine, as it were, as a spotlight on our Lord Jesus Christ. And so this confession begins this way. How do we learn who Christ is? In earlier chapters, it had talked about the deity of Christ. It had talked about how Christ never ceased to be innocent and yet suffered for a, a season the wrath of his Father, which sinners had deserved. That Christ, by his death, made full satisfaction for his people, but that it was impossible, now I'm quoting this confession, that the dollars of death should retain in bondage the author of life, and Christ was raised from the dead. Moreover, that Christ alone is the head of his kirk, or the church. And there had been this long number of articles before that spoke about Christ. And what this article is saying, how do we learn any of these truths about Jesus Christ? It is the Spirit who must teach us. The second thing to note is the Spirit is declared in this statement to be God. He needs to be fully divine because only one who is fully divine can overcome the insuperable barrier that is raised by human sinfulness to salvation. It is only one who is divine, who has the invincible power to quicken the dead. In an earlier statement in the confession, it had related what we are outside of Christ. We are enemies to God slaves to Satan, servants to sin. The image of God, it says in an earlier article, is utterly defaced in humanity. In the article I read, it, it describes the state of humanity. We, are, outside of Christ, are in a dreadful state. We are in one, a state that is spiritual death, complete blindness to divine realities an utter perversity of will that refuses to obey God. All of this is backed up by scripture statements. Ephesians 2.1, for instance. John 9.39. Matthew 17.17. 17. Only the Spirit can quicken what is dead. Only the Spirit can remove the darkness from our minds. The passage it cites at that point is Micah 7.8. Interesting text. It talks about the Lord is our light. Only the Spirit can bow stubborn hearts to the obedience of God's blessed will. Again, an interesting text. 1 Kings 8, 57 and 58, part of Solomon's prayer. Lord, do not leave us, because if you leave us, who will incline us to obey you? Now, all of this is a radical denial of what was the most prevalent theology in the late Middle Ages and was reaffirmed at the Council of Trent, which is that man's will is not so bound that he cannot cooperate with God in his salvation. You read the decrees of the Council of Trent, and those decrees in this regard have been reaffirmed in the re most recent Catholic Catechism. And this is why I'm, I'm up to the side here, but I'm not, I don't know what some current evangelicals are reading when they think that evangelicals can work in concert with Roman Catholics. They certainly haven't read the Council of Trent. I suspect some of them have. I don't, I don't know what's going on, but they haven't read the most recent Catholic Catechism, which reaffirms those doctrines. Those, the Roman Catholic thought in the Middle Ages assumed the sinfulness of human beings has not so bound their wills they cannot cooperate in their salvation. But this statement of faith unequivocally flies in the face of that. The sinner is utterly dead to God and can do nothing unless the Spirit quickens. And then third, the end of the article sounds another adversarial note against Roman Catholicism. 
both late medieval Catholic theology and the theology that was affirmed at the Council of Trent argued that they constructed, rather, a merit theology in which God ultimately gives eternal life on the basis of human merits. It may not be your merits, but it's the merit that is in that huge treasury of merit of those people, some of whom got into glory with more holiness than they needed. And that becomes a huge treasury of merit that the, the Pope, as the vicar of Christ, can give to the faithful. Not so. The statement of faith says that just as God brought us into being with no help from us, and the Lord Jesus Christ redeemed us when we were his enemies, so the Spirit bestows life on those who are utterly undeserving. We did not deserve life, nor do we in one sense deserve it after conversion. And he has, the statement has that fabulous uh, uh, statement, and you might not have caught it. We willingly spoil ourselves of all honor and glory in our regeneration. The statement rightly knows that any talk of human merit robs God of his glory. Now the other statement of faith, the Irish Articles of 1615. Because of English rule in Ireland, the Reformed Church was established as the state church in Ireland. The only example in the entirety of Europe where the leadership was reformed, but the people never followed. And the, probably there are a number of reasons for this. One of them has to have been the leadership was all English. And somehow there was not the connection made of, of raising up and bringing to the fore Irish preachers, native Irishmen. Anyway, by 1615, James I, the King James Version James, wanted a statement of faith for the Irish church. It, for whatever reason, had not adopted the 39 articles of the Church of England. And so he asked James Usher, who was the vice chancellor of Trinity College in Dublin, a reformed school for training ministers, to draw up the statement of faith. Usher is a remarkable individual. He was renowned in his day as the foremost biblical and patristic scholar. He was an inveterate bibliophile. He had a massive, massive library, which had numerous treasures in it. One of the most important treasures was the Book of Kells, the uh, Celtic copy of the, of the four Gospels, which is on display today in Trinity College, Dublin. He was a Puritan to the core, but he was also an Episcopalian. We tend to think of the Puritans as primarily Presbyterian, Congregationalist, or Baptist. He was a dyed-in-the-wool Episcopalian, believed in episcopacy, although it's interesting in the Irish articles, it doesn't say a word about it, which is curious. He also was a firm believer in the monarchy. We tend to think of Puritans as those who were opposed to the king. He was supporting the king. He was not invited, while well, he was invited to the Westminster Assembly in the 1640s, he was not allowed to take a seat because at the time he was in Oxford supporting King Charles I. He was in London when he saw the execution of Charles and apparently fainted before the actual uh, last blow, blow that took off Charles' head. And yet he was so respected by the Puritans that when he died in 1658, Oliver Cromwell gave him a state funeral in Westminster Abbey and allowed the funeral to be conducted along the lines of the Anglican Book of Common Prayer. He's a remarkable figure. The Irish articles are strongly Calvinistic. They set forth, an, among other things, a typical view of the, the, pure, the typical Puritan view of the Lord's Day. They assert in no uncertain terms the Pope is the Antichrist. You need to, and that usually when you state that, that statement, it raises a few chuckles, you need to always remember what it was like to be converted and to come into the truth in the 1500s and 1600s when you suddenly realized 
that the papacy had kept the church in spiritual darkness for a thousand years. It's not surprising most men and women in the day automatically assumed the Pope is the Antichrist. Strong emphasis on predestination. God had predestinated some unto life and reprobated, reprobated some unto death. We're not going to get into the issue of double predestination, but this, this, this statement of faith strongly affirms that. In Articles 32 and 33, it deals with regeneration. None can come unto Christ unless it be given unto him, unless the Father draw him. And all men are not so drawn by the Father that they may come unto the Son. Neither is there such a sufficient measure of grace vouchsafed, vouchsafed unto every man whereby he is enabled to come unto everlasting life. All God's elect are in their time inseparably united unto Christ by the effectual and vital influence of the Holy Ghost derived from him as from the head unto every true member of his mystical body. And being thus made one with Christ, they are truly regenerated and made partakers of him and all his benefits. The statement begins with an allusion, more than allusion, almost an exact quote of John 6, 44. None can come unto Christ unless it be given unto him, unless the Father draw him. And yet it's interesting the way in which it goes on to talk about regeneration. It doesn't do so in the same way as the Scottish Confession of Faith. In the Scottish Confession of Faith, there was an attack on the Roman Catholic theology of merit. This says nothing about merit. What this does is it sets regeneration in the order of salvation, what theologians call the ordo salutis. Regeneration is consequent upon predestination and effectual calling. It is those whom God has elected to save who will become regenerate. Now, some of this reflects Usher's own tendency to always view salvation through the lens of predestination. Here's a sermon he preached in 1617. The Lamb of God, offering himself a sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, intended by giving sufficient satisfaction to God's justice to make the nature of man which he assumed a fit subject for mercy and to prepare a medicine for the sins of the whole world which should be denied to none that intended to take the benefits of it. Howsoever, he intended not by applying this all-sufficient remedy unto every person in particular to make it effectual unto the salvation of all or to procure thereby the actual pardon for the sins of the whole world. In other words, Usher, as he thinks of regeneration, he thinks of it from the vantage point of predestination. But let me suggest strongly what is also going on here is there was emerging a new controversy within the ranks of the reformed community throughout Europe. And we know that controversy by the name of Arminianism. And it was Jacob Arminius who had studied under Beza, Calvin's great successor. Beza, by the way, has often been wrongly regarded as the black sheep who changed Calvin's emphasis to a focus on predestination. We don't have time to talk about that, but Beza was as pastorally minded as Calvin. Arminius had studied in Geneva under Beza, had come back to Holland, and eventually become a professor at the University of Leiden. And had there begun to teach a number of things that would throw the entire Reformed community into a massive turmoil. He had argued that predestination is nothing other than God's foreknowledge not using that term in a biblical sense, but God's foreseeing who would embrace Christ. He also argued that Christ's death obtained for every human being the possibility of salvation. And he also argued that the Holy Spirit's regenerating grace was not necessarily irresistible, that sinners could stop the Spirit's work of regeneration. And Usher, 1615, would not have been ignorant of these currents. And thus he realizes that in the statement of faith that was being drawn up, he needed to address the issue of Arminianism. Please note, I'm assuming you all know this, but again, it's important to note these sort of things. Statements of faith are not inerrant, and they are not infallible documents. 
I, li I like to think of them as the, the guardrails upon which, the, uh, upon which the, the church, as it were, runs. Or the, the church runs on the rails of Scripture. And statements of faith are the guardrails that protect the church and preventing it from going off the rails. But they are not what the church runs on. We run on Scripture alone. These men knew that. They also knew that sometimes statement of faith need, needs, to be, need, needs to be changed and focused on new issues that arise. Arminianism was not envisioned in the 1530s, 1540s, 1550s, 1560s. But suddenly now in the ranks of the Reformed, there were men who were creating a major, major theological problem. And thus Usher speaks to that issue in the Irish article. Not a, in other words, the... You see here, I think, very clearly how Reformed truth, because it's biblical truth, can speak to every situation that arises in the history of the church. At the time of the early years of the Reformation, the focus had to be the dismantling of a merit theology, that somehow men and women can merit salvation, that it had to focus on the, the fact that sinners are bound and dead in sin. The Arminian situation raised other issues. It raised the issue that God's work of regeneration was something he had purposed to do from time immemorial past. He ties it to predestination and election. And if we had the time, we could look down through the centuries and see how this same faith in the 18th century was used by an Andrew Fuller to speak against Unitarianism. Or well, this same faith gave the most cogent reply to liberalism in the late 19th and early 20th century. And I'm thinking here now of Warfield and Gresham Machen. And more and more as I read Warfield, I'm deeply impressed by the, the depth of scholarship and the bulwark that he raises against the liberalism of his day. But he, he does so from the platform of a, Calvin, of, of, of a reformed Christianity. Likewise, the strongest response today against what our brother alluded to last night, more than alluded to, mentioned open, the open theism perspective. It's going to have to be reformed men and women who are able to oppose that. There are two commonalities, different situations, but there are two commonalities I want to close in highlighting. First is, these two confessions, along with the others I cited, Emphasize salvation is on the basis of pure grace alone. It's nothing we do. It is God's pure grace at work in our lives. The second thing is to think and to speak anything less than that injures the great end of human existence. And now I'm taking a, a phrase out of the, the uh, shorter catechism, the answer to the first question, what is man's chief end? glorify God and enjoy Him forever. If we think anything less of God's grace, we injure, in one sense, that glorifying of God. It is only the confession that salvation is by grace and grace alone that brings glory to God. Let me stop here then, and then this afternoon we want to think about how did Baptist confessions deal with these same issues. Thank you. Well, let me close. Should I close in a word of prayer? Okay. Let me close in a word of prayer. Almighty God and Father, it is our delight to confess with these brethren of many, many years ago that the salvation in which you have brought us, the new life in Christ, is of your doing completely and totally. You brought us to regeneration. You quickened us. You opened our eyes. You freed us from the dominion of sin. You gave us a new will and new affections for our Lord Jesus Christ. And we confess this, that we might bring honor and glory to your name. Lord, drive these great truths home to our hearts. May they not only be on our lips, but may they resonate throughout our entire being that we might bring glory and honor to you, our Father, and to our Lord Jesus, and to the Holy Spirit.
we ask this for Christ's sake.